Hi, this is your host Sapin Bhartia and welcome to another episode of TFI Let's See. And today we have with us once again, Dave Birmingham, Director of Customer Success at Sios Technology. Dave, it's great to have you back on the show. Yeah, it's good to be back. Thanks. Uh, I'm glad to be here, Swapno. And today we are going to talk about how to configure SQL Server Standard Edition for achieving high availability on AWS. Can you talk a bit about um, how challenging, you know, or you know, uh, it is to build a high availability SQL Server infrastructure? on AWS? What are the challenges and what are the options that are available there? AWS is much like any other uh, data center. Your traditional options for SQL Server high availability are going to be the um, always-on availability groups, which uh, was introduced in SQL 2012, and the traditional SQL Server failover cluster instance, which has been around pretty much forever. Uh, we're talking about SQL Server Standard Edition today because one of the challenges uh, to deploy the always-on availability groups, it requires the SQL Server Enterprise Edition, and so there's a substantial cost associated with that. So many people need high availability, uh, but that's the only feature they need in the Enterprise Edition would be the always-on availability groups. They don't need any of the other features that come only with Enterprise. They could save a ton of money sticking with SQL Server Standard Edition if there were a way to build a SQL Server FCI using SQL Server Standard. And that's that's why we're here talking about that today. That's what we do a lot at SIOS, help people build you know, SQL Server failover clusters in the cloud, AWS and others, using SQL Server Standard Edition and saving a ton of money. And we'll be seeing a demo also later, but I am also curious that, you know, what are the occasions when somebody would choose to deploy their own SQL Server instance on EC2 versus just using RDS? When we talk about cloud, you have the infrastructure as a service or EC2 in AWS, where you're building everything from scratch. You're deploying the virtual machines with the OS, and then you're installing SQL Server on top of them and managing it just like you manage your own um, instance, your own, you know, your own uh, virtual machine. Versus RDS, which is a managed service, so it's database as a service. And RDS, Relational Database Services, comes in many flavors in terms of the actual um, rep, uh, relational database management system that it uses, including SQL Server as one of those options. So. How do you choose between one or the other? At SIOS, you know, we primarily work uh, in the um, EC2 space or the infrastructure service space where you're managing it yourself. Uh, so if, you're, if you are moving to the cloud and you're, you need to run a database, a SQL Server or other, you may consider the uh, relational database services. And uh, one of the reasons that you might do that is it's managed for you, so you don't have to take care of the installation or management of the actual uh, database instance itself. That's all taken care of, of by the cloud vendor. But on the downside is it, you don't have full control over that instance. So if you need to run custom modules or extensions or anything else where you need access to the, the database engine itself, you may be limited there. And chances are you're coming from, if you're moving from on-prem into the cloud, you probably are running your own instance of SQL Server. Uh, and so you have familiarity with that. You have all your customizations or optimizations. Uh, if you're moving that to the cloud and you want to move to RDS, there's going to be a whole series of validations you need to run to ensure that you're going to be able to get the same kind of uh, performance and all the same features that you're currently using on-prem uh, in the cloud if you're moving to that relational database management, uh, the RDS service. Whereas if you simply deploy SQL Server uh, on EC2, it's pretty much the same as you're running on-prem today. And so there's less chance of you encountering limitations uh, that you you won't know until you you know go down the road of doing that. 
But if you're, you know, if it's a green field and you're building new applications and you can live with the limitations of, of RDS, which you know, includes different, uh, again, depending upon your options, you're limited into the database size uh, that you can deploy um, 16 terabytes, or 64 terabytes. But there are hard limits that are implemented in RDS that you won't have to deal with if you're managing your own uh, system. And then availability options as well, there are certainly uh, with RDS, you can choose to enable highly available configurations where you're uh, leveraging um, always on availability groups that you know manage behind the scenes to replicate between availability zones. Uh, whereas in EC2, you have the options of always on availability groups as well as the, um, the we call sandless cluster, basically a, a SQL Server fill of a cluster instance that leverages uh, Cyrus Data Keeper to keep the local storage in sync across the availability zones, as you will see in the demo, also regions or combinations. So you have more flexibility and more options in terms of availability using EC2 as well. Can you talk about uh, the storage options that are there when somebody is deploying a SQL Server FCI? The challenge of building a SQL Server FCI in AWS or really any cloud or any environment where you want to run your nodes in different data centers, which effectively um, AWS availability zones are different data centers, right? A normal SQL Server SCI requires some sort of shared storage device where all the data sits either SAN, iSCSI, or something along those lines. In the cloud, where again, you're running instances in different availability zones, the concept of shared storage is not really a viable option because that shared disk needs to live in one of those availability zones. So instead, if you want to build a SQL Server FCI, there are a few options. So there's um, a service from AWS called FSX, which is basically a managed um, um, a managed SMB share. So um, a SQL Server does support the ability to put databases on an SMB share. So you can do it that way. Uh, there are some limitations. Not every feature of SQL Server supports SMB shares. And you can only configure that to span um, availability zones. There's no option to span your cluster across regions. Uh, but that is one option. And uh, there's a cost associated with that as the number of, of IOPS that you need uh, increases, the, the cost increases as well. The other option is um, what we you know, do at SIOS. We have a product called SIOS Data Keeper which does block level volume replication either synchronously between availability zones or asynchronously between availability zones and um, or, or regions, I should say, or combination. Uh, if you wanna have a multi-node cluster, as we'll see in the uh, demo, you can do synchronous between two, uh, between two instances in different availability zones and also asynchronously to a third uh, server in an entirely different region, or even really an entirely different cloud or even back uh, hybrid cloud configuration. So there's, it's a lot more flexibility. You're not tied into the uh, AWS uh, ecosystem. You, you have more flexibility to extend it um, above and beyond. Are there any limitations of SQL Server standard edition versus, of course, enterprise edition. As we mentioned earlier, the always on availability groups is fully supported only with the enterprise edition. Now they do have a basic availability group that they introduced in SQL Server 2016 standard edition, but that only supports a single database per availability groups. And that, so really only, only the smallest environments might be able to use that. It gets a little unwieldy because each List, each um, availability group needs its own listener, means it needs its own IP address, and you are limited in AWS to the number of additional secondary IP addresses you can uh, allocate to an instance, so you can't really expand that. So it's, uh, it's not really a viable option, except in the smallest circumstances. But beyond the, um, the availability options, SQL Server Standard Edition, uh, again, 
as each version releases, so I'm just talking general generality here, the number of uh, processor cores that it supports will be limited. Uh, currently, you can up to 64 processor cores, whereas the Enterprise Edition supports up to 640 processor cores. Uh, also, the amount of memory, so standard edition at 128 gigabyte versus enterprise up to 24 terabyte. Uh, and there's other features, column store indexes, data compression, in-memory OLTP that are only available in enterprise edition. Uh, transparent data encryption, advanced auditing are some other features. So, like I said earlier, if you don't use in-memory OLTP or you don't need the column store indexes, um, then, and the only thing you're looking at enterprise for is the always on availability groups, you might want to have a hard look at, you know, sticking with standard edition and then using something like Cyrus Data Keeper to, uh, to build filler cluster instances for availability rather than jumping up to enterprise and the always on availability groups. Now it's time to see uh, all of this in action. So let's have a look at the demo. Before I jump over to the demo here, I'll just uh, paint a picture for you. So what we're gonna look at is actually uh, a three node cluster. And one of the one of the limitations of SQL Server Standard Edition, I, sh I should have mentioned earlier, is that uh, it only supports a two node cluster. So why am I showing you a three node cluster? Well, the SQL Server Standard Edition only supports two nodes in the cluster. However, DataKeeper will still allow you to replicate to a third node. Uh, so you can still have that high availability maybe between two nodes in the same region between availability zones, but also replicate to a third node in a different region. Now, if you're using Enterprise Edition, fine, plug that third node in as um, another node in your cluster and get all the advantages of having failover clustering on all three nodes. If you're using standard edition, then what we would have done is we would have only replicated to that third node. We, uh, we wouldn't put it in the cluster and instead the recovery would be more of a manual process where you would reverse the mirror direction and attach the databases. And then you would have your disaster recovery application servers already pre-configured to point at that DR node of SQL Server. But either way, um, the configuration that we're looking at is going to be um, two nodes of SQL Server between availability zones in US East 1, uh, and then also a third node in uh, an entirely different AWS region, uh, US East 2, so I think it's Virginia and Ohio, doing asynchronous replication, and we're gonna see um, how you can easily, through failover cluster interface, just move your workload either manually or, of course, failover clustering will detect failures and do automated recovery uh, between all your cluster nodes. So let me jump over to the demo here. All right, this is a quick demo of a three-node cluster in AWS with two nodes in one region uh, spread between two availability zones and a third node in a different region. So I'm looking right now at my um, DR region. In my DR region, I have a domain controller and I have uh, the SQL disaster node, the third node. You see that's in um, Virginia, US East 1 availability zone in Virginia. I'll switch over to um, US East 2. And I have um, Another domain controller, so of course redundancy in my domain controller, so DC primary. Then I have a SQL primary, and I have a SQL secondary. You see SQL primary is in US East 2B, and SQL secondary is in US East 2C, so different availability zones. So let's switch over. I'm connected to uh, my primary, uh, SQL primary right now. I have failover cluster manager up and running, um, as you can see, I have a SQL Server cluster um, already configured and running. It's currently running on my disaster recovery node. So it says SQL disaster is the owner node. And um, if I run a simple query here, let me refresh this. So if I run a, a simple query to show the, the server that's running on, 
I will see that it is, it is in fact running on SQL Disaster. And what's enabling this all is Sinus Data Keeper. So we see that Data Keeper is replicating the storage between all the cluster nodes. So currently we have two volumes in this cluster, the D drive and the E drive. And we see that the, the D drive is currently active on SQL Disaster and replicating back to SQL Secondary as also replicating from SQL Disaster to SQL Primary. This cross-region replication is doing asynchronous replication. And once we um, fail over to the back to the primary server, we'll see um, what happens here. So let's go ahead and move that workload to, let's say, SQL Primary. So while this is happening, I'm going to execute this query again. We'll see that uh, if it's waiting to respond. So it's waiting for this to come online. So keep an eye over here. And as SQL recovers, this query will um, complete and show that we are running on SQL primary. So we're starting SQL server and things are online. And here we go. So the query just completed. It says SQL primary. So now we're running on SQL server primary. And uh, DataKeeper also is updated to reflect that primary is the new owner. And you can see that um, we're replicating now the D drive from primary to disaster still asynchronously, but we're also replicating from primary to secondary. And this mirror is synchronous because uh, that's in the same region between availability zones. So we can do synchronous replication in that cross AZ configuration. And finally, let's uh, go all the way around the horn here and let's now move from SQL primary and move this workload to SQL secondary. And so we'll do that. Same thing, I'll execute this query one more, one more time and we'll wait for it to come back as soon as it recovers on uh, SQL primary. This query will complete and showing that it's running on um, SQL secondary. So here we go, coming online. And there it is, so SQL secondary. So all of this, you know, client reconnection happened um, automatically, uh, switch over times are very quick. And that's again, going cross availability zones and also cross region. So that's it, a very simple demonstration of Silos Data Keeper, enabling a multi uh, availability zone cluster as well as a multi region cluster in AWS. Dave, thank you so much for showing this excellent demo and of course uh, talk about SQL Server Standard Edition for high availability on AWS and also kind of comparison between the Standard Edition and of course the Enterprise Edition that is pretty obvious there. But thank you for sharing all those, uh, you know, uh, not only sharing those insights, technologies, but also showing how it works. And I look forward to our next discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Swagnal. I look forward to it.